In just two minutes in the Kursk region, this Ukrainian Abrams tank took six direct hits from FPV drones. Two more missed, and one got tangled in a makeshift net that Ukrainian tankers had installed themselves. Safe to say, the engineers who designed the Abrams probably never imagined it would end up in a situation like this. Especially since these exact drones were far from ordinary. So what happened next? The crew waited for the shaking from the drone hits to settle down. Then they all climbed out unharmed, singing praises to American armor. Not a single crew member was injured. But why did this Abrams stop? Could a few pounds of explosives really turn one of the world's best tanks into a sitting duck? The warhead on a typical FPV drone isn't massive. Anywhere from 4.5 to 10 pounds. Usually it's an RPG-7 grenade, the same kind used by both sides. Soldiers call them carrots. But there's nothing funny about them, they can punch through 400 millimeters of armor. These warheads use a shaped charge which creates a superheated jet that melts right through armor leaving behind a neat little hole. That's under ideal conditions. Hitting a moving tank isn't easy. But immobilizing it? That's a different story. Especially if the drone operator knows exactly where to aim. The roof of the hull, the top of the turret, or the engine compartment. FPV drones were practically built to exploit these weak spots. Check this out! The first drone hit the Abrams engine bay. Luckily it didn't burst into flames because that's more of a Soviet tank tradition. The next step? Either more drones aiming for the weak spots, or a follow-up attack with artillery, ATGMs or mortars before the tank could be rescued. That's why the Ukrainian Abrams crew had some tense moments waiting for the right time to get out safely. The commander of this tank later said that without tough American armor they wouldn't have survived. Hit that like button if you agree! But here's the real twist. The Russians weren't just using any FPV drones, and this is why the US is rethinking how to upgrade the Abrams. Right now, the sky over the battlefield is as packed with drones as piranhas in the Amazon River. And more and more of them are FPV drones running of fiber optic cables. That means they can't be jammed or disrupted by electronic warfare. And that's a huge problem because Western doctrine for countering drones relies heavily on EW systems. For example, the latest Abrams M1A2 variant, designated System Enhancement Package version 3, doesn't have a full-fledged electronic warfare system, but does feature counter IED jamming and can integrate with external electronic warfare defenses. The planned SEPV4 version was supposed to have these capabilities as well, but it got cancelled. And honestly, if it had been produced, it would have been dead on arrival. The war in Ukraine has made it painfully clear that passive defenses alone aren't enough to stop fiber-optic controlled drones. That's why the US Army is skipping SEPV-4 altogether and going straight for the Abrams M1E3. The Army announced its development in September the 2023, and by May 2024, a contract was signed with General Dynamics Land Systems. One of the Army's key demands? an integrated active protection system that can take down drones and other threats from above using both kinetic and non-kinetic methods. Because while fiber optic drones are a new challenge, all the old tank killing weapons are still very much in play. Right now, the only APS that has actually been tested and proven in real combat is Trophy, an Israeli system developed by Raphael, which has long worked alongside US Abrams developers. The way Trophy works against drones is the same as it does against anti-tank missiles. Radar detects an incoming threat. The onboard computer calculates the perfect intercept moment in milliseconds. The launchers fire countermeasures straight at the target. According to Raphael, the ability to counter top-down drone attacks can be added via a software update to existing Trophy units. But the US Army wants more, because in Ukraine it's never just one drone attack. That's why they need an integrated APS one that can reload automatically without forcing a crew member to step outside and do it manually. If you want more Abrams videos, make sure to subscribe to this channel. Of course, APS is all about protection, but a tank isn't just a sitting duck. It's a predator, built to attack and work alongside other units. Watching this Abrams in action in a Ukrainian village, you'd think it was having an easy day. No Russian drones buzzing overhead, no immediate threats. But inside, it's all work and no play and no one works harder than the loader. Fun fact, each round weighs at least 44 pounds and the tank carries 55 of them. And let's just say, the loader's workspace isn't the most ergonomic. No, we're not talking about the coffee machine and toilet in the British Challenger 2. Yes, really. We covered the cozy life of the Challenger's crew in another video. By comparison, the Abrams is downright cramped. And that means the loader spends long hours in a tight space working in an awkward position. 
Sure, a seasoned loader can outpace an autoloader, but only for a while. What if he gets tired? What if he's concussed? Or worse, what if his back gives out mid-battle? That's why the US Army wants the new Abrams M1E3 to have an autoloader. This time, for real. See, the Army had avoided autoloaders in the past. Early attempts to integrate one into the Abrams didn't go well. Plus, in many tanks with autoloaders, ammo is stored inside the turret carousel, just like on Soviet and Russian tanks. And when those go up in flames, so does the entire crew. In contrast, the human loader was considered the safer option, because the Abrams stores its ammo separately in an armored compartment. Over time, this led to an entire cult of tank loaders. Big, strong guys who swear manual bitch. loading is superior. Go ahead, tell them otherwise. I dare you. Another argument against autoloaders? The loader wasn't just a loader. He was also a backup driver, a gunner's assistant, and an extra set of hands for maintenance. But, let's be honest, that's like hiring another janitor instead of getting a vacuum cleaner. Or paying a barista instead of buying a coffee machine. It's 2025. Autoloaders are happening. Progress wins. With an autoloader, the Abrams crew will shrink to just three people. Fewer crew members equals a lower tank profile, which means better battlefield survivability. More importantly, it paves the way for a fully unmanned turret, solving the biggest safety concern for tank crews. That's why the new tank is called the M1E3. That E means it's not just an upgrade, it's a serious evolution. And with an autoloader comes a new gun. The exact choice is still unknown, but there are some strong contenders. XM360E1, an American prototype designed specifically for Abrams. It can fire next-gen hypersonic anti-tank missiles and guided artillery shells. You've probably seen it mounted on the Abrams X-Tech demonstrator. L55A1, a German 120mm smoothbore with an extended barrel for higher muzzle velocity, better accuracy, and increased penetration. It can also fire a wide range of modern NATO rounds, including programmable airburst shells. But here's where things get interesting. According to the Army Science Board's 2023 report, future tanks should be lighter and armed with a bigger caliber gun. Hmm, what's bigger than 120 millimeters? Well, there aren't many options in the Western world. One exception, the French 140 millimeter cannon tested on a modified Leclerc. Sounds great. More firepower equals better tank, right? Not so fast. 120 millimeters is the NATO standard. Imagine the logistical nightmare of switching to a new caliber across the US Army and NATO. A 140 millimeter weighs over 1,100 pounds more than a 120 millimeter gun. And here's the kicker. The M1E3 is supposed to weigh under 60 tons. That's what the US Army wants and what the Army Science Board strongly recommends. So for now, bigger guns are off the table. Will the Abrams M1E3 lose armor to shed weight? Luckily, no. Instead, it's getting a hybrid diesel-electric engine. Right now, the Abrams runs on a gas turbine beast, the AGT-1500, packing 1,500 horsepower and chugging Jet Propellant 8, a kerosene-based aviation fuel. It gives the Abrams insane acceleration, but at a steep price. The fuel consumption is terrible. It burns through 10 gallons just to start up. That's a full tank for a small car, enough to take you across the country. And that's not even the biggest issue. In Iraq, crews had to clean the engine filters twice a day or risk total failure. Skip it for 12 hours and the whole system might need replacing, including the transmission, something impossible to do in the field. The engine is also complex, requiring highly trained techs who take years to master its upkeep. A hybrid system, on the other hand, is much simpler. It's still a diesel but with generators, and it actually helps cut weight. The current Abrams carries 500 gallons of fuel, but switching to 200 gallons instantly drops the weight by a full ton. Removing the auxiliary power unit saves even more, and a new transmission cuts over 4,000 pounds while eliminating another weak spot. Beyond the weight savings, a hybrid Abrams would be stealthier. Right now, the AGT-1500 roars like a jet engine. The hybrid version would be much quieter with a lower heat signature, making it harder to detect and target. On top of that, it simplifies logistics. No more need for special fuel, and less fuel needed overall means fewer supply convoys, prime targets for the enemy. The M1E3 will be lighter, smaller, harder to detect, easier to maintain, and deadlier than ever. And that's before even getting into AI-powered command systems, networked combat capabilities, and integration with unmanned platforms. Sounds like a dream, right? But will it actually make it on time? The US Army wants the M1E3 in service by the early 2030s. What will they have to sacrifice to hit that deadline? 
Will they drop the autoloader? Ignore the 60 ton weight limit? Let us know what you think in the comments.